It could be copy, and we're currently thinking about it, but I do want to let you know that we do see SSC1, so thank you for your work. Okay. I just manually connected it to, to the um, ISS underscore MSL underscore 2.4 gigahertz, so you should see it now. This is Mission Control Houston. In addition to this laptop work that Cassidy is discussing with the team here on the ground now, uh, the main activity on his timeline today was some routine maintenance work on the Combustion's integrated rack. That's a specialized experiment facility located in the Destiny Laboratory, and it's actually part of the Fluids and Combustion Facility, which also houses the Fluids Integrated Rack. We have here on the phone with us today Robert Corbin, the Fluids and, uh, and Combustion Facility Manager from NASA's Glenn Research Center. Thanks so much for joining us, Robert. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about these facilities and how what goes into designing uh, a combustion um, experiment facility to work in space. I, in, to work in space, I expect that's a little a little tricky. <laughs> well, the uh, combustion integrated rack actually is maybe a second generation rack. We used to fly on the space shuttle back in the in the eighties and CM one and CM two combustion module one combustion module two. And uh, obviously one of the major designs is to contain any fire that you're burning um, in some kind of controlled uh, a chamber. So the main feature of the combustion air graded rack is the uh, combustion chamber. Okay, and so I guess the, the combustion chamber essentially has to, in addition to holding the um, experiment, has to protect the rest of the station from that experiment. Yeah, it does, and it also sets the environment for which the um, principal investigator, you know, wants to see during a series of data points. Um, so, you know, Chris will be going in to the chamber today to pull out, you know, basically the experiment, and he'll be replacing the uh, fuel reservoir in there so that they can continue to do their experimentation this week. And we're actually seeing some video of him doing that work from earlier this morning now. This is recorded video that shows him looking inside the uh, combustion integrated rack and, and getting ready to do some of those change outs. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it holds, I guess, you can change out the different types of fuel so that the, uh, the researchers can, can see the effects of different, um, different types of materials as they're uh, ignited in space? Yeah, I mean, this one is all focused on uh, on droplets, you know, liquid-type uh, combustion, uh, you know, phenomena. So I th he's replacing one of the fuel reservoirs, and they're looking at heptane. Um, the researchers um, have a series of different fuels they look at, and uh, they also change the environment inside the chamber to an either enrich it in helium or enrich it in uh, xenon or whatever that have different characteristics. Um, so that they can see how it extinguishes. Um, they kind of understand a lot more about the phenomena um, of combustion uh, by doing that. And I, I think one of the reasons they're interested in that is because um, fire behaves a little differently in space than it does here on the ground. Is that right? Uh, it does, yes. Um, first of all, you know, if you see like a candle, you'll see like a, you know, convective uh, flow around it, and you'll see the point, you know, as it, you know, gravity um Obviously, heat rises, things like that. In space, you'll see a nice blue uh, burning flame ball, um, and yet it also burns much longer. Um, and what they're really concentrating on is what, you know, what, one, whether or not we can even ignite it in that particular environment. And then, two, once we do, um, they want to look at how it extinguishes in two different uh, phenomena. Um, one of the things they're starting to see as well is what they call a cool flames uh, phenomena, where they... Um, the flame is visibly out, but it still has a very rapid evaporation, and it's called cool flame. So it's actually a flame combustion process ongoing. Yeah, I remember reading about that, and I think it was a bit of an unexpected finding. Is that right? Uh, well, yeah, they've seen it a little bit before, I think, in some of the shuttle experiments, uh, but now they're concentrating more and more on that. Um, that area is, is sort of new and trying to understand a lot more about what's happening there so that they can understand better, you know, some of the combustion phenomena on the ground, such as knocking and, you know, diesel engines and things like that, um, so that they can make, you know, more efficient engines, more combustion, you know, efficient combustion processes.
And this uh, rack has been on the space station for a few years now, I think. And um, right. do you feel like we've been getting good um, good data out of it? Yeah, I th let's see. We were launched in, I believe it was 2008. Um, and so, yeah, I think it was on STS-126. And so, uh, yeah, we've been getting a lot of good data. Um, you know, the, the kind of the difference with the combustion experiments is they're developing a huge matrix. So, um, you know, like this particular set of experiments, they're doing something like 120 different, you know, uh, data points just to understand better what they're seeing and what they're experiencing in the different atmospheres. Um, so it takes a long time, and so some of these experiments aren't just a one-time deal. It, it goes over years, and so, um, yeah, we've been getting a lot of good data coming back. Great. Well, um, so the combustion integrated rack is combined with the fluids integrated rack into Correct. one facility. What, is that just for convenience and, and space, or is there a reason to have those two together? Uh, no, actually, the combustion integrated rack, which Chris is working on today, you know, obviously is in the U.S. lab, and then right to the right of it is the fluids integrated rack. Um, sometimes you'll see it on the camera. It'll have a kind of a grid-looking uh, net in front of it because it's a, what they call an aris type rack, which means it floats um, or can float uh, off of some kind of an active isolation system. Um, so that's right to the, to the uh, right of the SIR if you're looking at it. Um, but the FUR and the SIR, they have a lot of common hardware between them in terms of the way that it deals with its interfaces with the avionics to the station as well as its power distribution. But um, And they also both have what we would kind of call a um, optics bench uh, within those uh, racks that kind of slides out when the crew needs to get access to the back of the rack. Um, so that's where some of the common areas are. And then after that, there's a lot of big differences. Um, the fur is a very large open volume, and in it right now is the uh, light microscopy module, which is a microscope that uh, is uh, fully automated uh, to do a lot of the science uh, that we need to do in a very microscopic um, you know, research kind of area. And so there is some big differences also between the two racks. Okay, and um, you just mentioned that the, the microscope that is in the fluids rack at the moment is fully automated. I think that's, you know, g generally the case for these experiments that the crew doesn't have to do a whole lot of work with them other than get them started. Is is that? Uh, both of them, yeah, very similar. Um, when these were designed, the concept was that uh, we pretty much thought crew, the crew's time was going to be very precious, and uh, it's sort of still the case. Um, so we did a lot of things where we wanted the crew to interact with our different pieces of hardware um, to set up the experiments, and, but then they could uh, close the doors and kind of walk away um, sometimes for days and sometimes for weeks, and we can do experiments, and then they would have to come back and, um, and then, just like he's doing today, change out the fuel or change out an igniter that may burn out or whatever, but, um, but most of it we were not having a cruise hands-on doing the experiments, um, sim you know, like the MSG, uh, which is also next to the SIR, uh, the crew has a lot of on-hands um, experiment work, which obviously they like doing, but um, because of the nature of, of, uh, of the flames in the uh, combustion rack and the microscopic nature of the work we had to do in the fur, we had to automate a lot of that stuff. Okay. Well, um, anything else that we should be looking forward to with, with either of these uh, facilities? Any experiments coming up that will be especially interesting? Uh, well, the LMM, the light microscopy module, um, they're going to go in, and uh, we, had a, we had a little bit of an issue a couple weeks ago. The crew's going to go in and take care of that, and we'll be back up and running in a, in a couple weeks. Um, again, they'll be back looking at uh, colloid-type uh, research uh, to better understand uh, the phenomena of basically of particles interacting and making structures uh, in space when you have no gravity. Um, and the combustion, um, he's also going to be doing something we haven't done since we launched, which is not that complicated, but the, uh, today Chris will also be changing out the, um, the seals actually on the combustion chamber. Um, those do need to be replaced uh, periodically just to maintain, you know, that we get a vacuum in there and we can keep everything that needs to stay in there uh, in the chamber. So he'll be doing that as well today. Okay. Well, we'll watch out for that as well. Thank you so much for talking with us. We really appreciate it. All right.
Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. This was Robert Corbin, the Fluids and Combustion Facility Manager from NASA's Glenn Research Center.